morning and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, which we are running fully remotely today. Feels like a long time since we've done that. Dog wrapped in a blanket beside me, so hopefully he stays quiet the entire time. And we have a few apologies this morning. We have apologies from Miles Briggs and from Faisal Chowdhury. Our first item of business today is a decision to take item five in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much for that. And our second um, agenda item is a decision on taking um, our future work programme um, meetings in private as well in the future. Are we all agreed on that? Thanks very much. Um, and our agenda item three um, is our main item of business this morning. Uh, previously due to hear from the Auditor General of Scotland on the 5th, uh, 15th of September, this session was postponed due to the suspension of parliamentary business. We have rescheduled this meeting to hear from Audit Scotland about its report on the implementation of the Social Security Programme and its annual audit reports on Social Security Scotland. And I welcome to the meeting Stephen Boyle, who is the Auditor General of Scotland, and Kirsty Ridd, who is the Audit Manager of Audit Scotland. And we have a few themes to get through this morning. Um, we are going to be discussing um, themes around transparency and accountability, agile approaches, workforce, implementation costs, and remaining work to date and the key risks, risks ahead of us. I will turn to um, members for their questions. Um, Stephen and Kirsty, if I can ask you to give a few seconds for broadcasting to turn on your microphones. And members, if I can ask you to um, direct your questions um, to Stephen, who will bring in Kirsty as he needs to do so. And we are going to turn now um, to Jeremy Balfour for the first questions to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Over to yourself, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavina, and good morning um, to you both. Thank you very much for coming uh, on a Monday morning. Um, a couple of questions just around where we are at the moment. Um, I think the last contact the audit team had with Social Security Scotland uh, and the programme was February of this year. I'm just wondering, could you give us an update of what contact you've had with them and um, anything to update us on around that, please? Good morning, committee. Um, delighted to be with you this morning, actually, and thank you, Mr. Balfour, for, for, for your question. Um, I'm happy to start, actually, and, and I'll bring Kirsty in um, in a moment. Um, I think, as the committee know, we published um, our report in the spring based on our work up to the end of February 2022. Clearly, as we can set out in the report, that this is a, um, a really evolving picture and a fast-moving programme of activity. Um, I'm sure the committee will want to know a, a bit more detail as, as we progress. Um, at a high level, our annual audit is continuing, and we expect to conclude that um, later this month. Some of the issues that we touch on um, in the report around financial management, workforce planning, and uh, some of the performance information mm -hmm. will also feature in the annual audit report. Um, in addition to that, the committee will know there's been some major milestones that have taken place uh, since the publication of uh, our report, notably around the launch of the adult disability um, payment as well. Um, so our interest in Social Security is live. Um, as ever, at, at the conclusion of the annual audit, that the auditors and I uh, discuss progress, I take stock of findings, and we'll factor that into our future work programme. I think as is set out in the report that there is welcome progress, but still a lot of work to do. I think, from an audit perspective, we recognise the need to continue reporting publicly on that. Um, Mr. Balfour, I'll pause for a moment. I'm going to hand over to Kirsty um, if there's anything um, she wishes to add uh, to what I've mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, nothing significant to add at that point. I think, as um, the Auditor General's mentioned, we're continuing our work on the annual audit of Social Security Scotland at the moment, with an aim for that to conclude um, later in the autumn. Um, and we continue as part of that our kind of routine engagement with Social Security Scotland and colleagues in the implementation programme, but nothing further to add at the moment. Uh, just to follow that up, if I can, um, Auditor General, um, clearly over the last year or so we've seen an increase in regard to the number of people employed by the agency. We've seen a spiraling of cost on an upward trend. Have you concerns around that? Are these issues being raised with Social Security Scotland in regard to are they 
um, able to keep control of their budget and of the staff and needs that they require. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Belfort. I, I put I, your signal or my signal cut, cut out for a moment or two, but I, I think you, I picked your question up. Is really the overall kind of cost envelope that they're operating in, and yeah. particularly the workforce. Great, I think I'll happy to yeah. answer that. Um, you're right. Both those themes are, are really important, um, and I think what we sought to do in our report really was to track back to the financial memorandum through to the circumstances at the end of 2021 and beginning of 22. And we noted a couple of things. One is was the scale of change in the programme and the agency in terms of workforce numbers. Um, we are content that you know, workforce planning is, is progressing. Um, and we haven't formed a, an adverse judgment, I should say, about other workforce or uh, finances relative to the financial memorandum. Primarily setting out that perhaps what was anticipated when the financial memorandum was uh, published and subject to scrutiny in the Parliament, matters have evolved at pace. So, just with the understanding of the implementation costs, the number of people required to deliver these benefits um, are reflective of, of some of the updated numbers that we see. Um, there is still a lot to do. I think this is the kind of one of the points that we sought to make in the report, and there are still uh, financial risks for the agency and the government. The committee, I'm sure, will be familiar with some of the uh, updated forecasts that the Scottish Fiscal Commission have made um, on a couple of points. When we reported, um, we noted that by 2026, the benefit spending forecast would be £760 million higher than the equivalent um, block grant. That number was then updated to 1.3 billion by Social Security Scotland, and that number that number brings management challenges. It brings fiscal sustainability challenges, and it requires options and opportunity cost management for the government um, and the Parliament when it scrutinises and, and sets the budget. But the workforce numbers are also going to have to require careful management um, as well. Um, there is a workforce plan in place. Kirsty might want to say a bit more um, about how that's operating. Um, and just given the, and perhaps some of the more background as to why that's evolved, um, Kirsty. Thanks, Auditor General. Yep, on the workforce planning, there's the two aspects that we've touched on. Firstly, the program itself and the staffing in there, and then the staffing for Social Security Scotland. I think at the time of reporting, we um, referenced an a number of around 1,800. Staff in Social Security Scotland, we do have uh, more up to date figures published now. So, the Scottish Government most recently published on its workforce figures in um, September, which reported a position up to June 2022. And at that point, we were looking at a number of around 3,000 staff in place, um, which is the sort of trajectory that they were setting out at the point when we reported. Um, and indeed, I think we referenced a figure of about 3,500 staff by spring of next year. So I think that gives a sense of the progress that's been made in the scale of increase that's been made in the staffing. Um, we commented in the report that the workforce planning is um, developing within Social Security Scotland, but that there are um, inherent uncertainties in the staffing that they will require and that will need to be managed going forward as they bring forward new benefits and as they um, adapt to how the processing of those benefits actually takes place once they're fully embedded. Um, in terms of the programme staffing, um, as um, the Auditor General mentioned, we have kind of taken a reference point of the financial memorandum and we've provided some of the updated figures in the report around where that is now. And it's something which we've commented on around looking for that ongoing reporting from the Scottish Government around the overall implementation costs. Um, and the workforce is something that would absolutely feed into what we would be hoping to see um, mm -hmm. in that updated reporting. Thanks. Thank you. And just my final question in this section is in regard to um, the actual benefits being delivered. We saw over the summer, for example, Best Grant had a fairly um, major delay in people getting the money that they were expecting. Have you looked at are there enough people at the moment working on the appropriate benefits? And have you come to a conclusion of why these delays have been taking place over the summer? Thanks for that. I'm happy to start. Actually, I'll ask um, Kirsty to come in on 
um, the specifics of the uh, the best art grant as the kind of uh, circumstances we are aware of. Um, I think in overall terms, we do look at the operational effectiveness of um, of the agency and public bodies and the, the discharge of um, their management of public funds through our, our annual audit process. Um, public bodies themselves are accountable for this. The accountable officer of each public body is you know, personally responsible for the effective management um, of their funds, and they set that out through their own annual report and accounts. So we're looking at that closely, just in terms of overall uh, effectiveness. I think it builds on the work that we set out in the report that the committee has um, in front of it, and really just one that we are taking stock about you know, where we go next as part of our own forward work programme. Um, Kirsty's mentioned some of the detail on the scale of change of, of people um, employed by the agency. Um, and we also, perhaps beforehand to Kirsty, I think we also noted that um, uh, COVID has been a real factor in terms of the pace of um, rollout and implementation of uh, the benefits and some of the change of work, working practices um, within the agency. We're keeping a close eye on that as part of our forward work. But I'll hand over to Kirsty again if there's anything further she wants to add. Just comment that it's not the issues around the Best Start grant, which um, the member raised, is not something which we looked at specifically in this audit, given the timing. Um, and as the Auditor General has mentioned, we would look to comment further on the kind of performance management arrangements and what that information is telling Social Security Scotland when we report on the annual audit later in the autumn. Um, I think there are a range of things at the moment with a, ma a significant scale delivery of adult disability payment over the summer period. I think Social Security Scotland have been quite clear that there will be um, performance, you know, there will be bedding in sort of issues around delivery of new benefits and that that will need to kind of balance out over time once benefits come on stream and the operation of those becomes more business as usual, if you like. Um, so there may be issues like that, but it is something that we didn't look at in detail as part of this audit. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kavina. I'll leave it there at the moment. Thanks very much for that. Um, we'll now move on to questions from Pam Duncan Glancy. Pam. Thank you, Convener, um, and good morning, uh, Auditor General, um, and to Kirsty. Thank you for for answering the question so far, and also for the briefing that you sent in advance. It was really helpful. Um, I I wanted. Um, talk a little bit about the, the transparency and, and you said in in your report that you'd expect to see more detail in the updated business case. Um, could you set out what more detail you'd be looking to see and how frequently you'd expect costings to be published? Thank you. Good morning, uh, Ms Duncan Glancy. Yeah, one of our one of our key recommendations in the report is to note firstly that implementation costs haven't been routinely reported. Um, in public. And as I mentioned in um, previous um, response to Mr Balfour, um, we're not drawing a critical judgment per se on the scale of change in costs. I think that's given that the scale of responsibilities um, have changed. The rollout of benefits have been interrupted um, by COVID. There's been quite high level assumptions in the original financial memorandum that have changed and evolved as the programme has been developed. But one of the things that we haven't seen is that um, regular updating of costs, and you know we do make that recommendation that that needs to be a, a much clearer feature of the implementation program as it moves forward. Timing and frequency of that, we think that that's probably one for um, the agency, perhaps together with this committee and, and the government, to take a view as to what would best suit um, parliamentary scrutiny, public understanding. Um, whether it's annual or whether it's more frequent than that, I think that's a that's a call to be made. Our overall point was, given the scale of public spending that exists um, in this programme, that it requires um, clearer and more frequent um, public reporting than we've seen thus far. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, on on this point. I'm slightly concerned about the, some of the, the concerns raised by the Scottish Fiscal Commission around data gaps, and in particular the difference between the data that they've been able to collect in Scotland um, from Social Security Scotland um, and the, the data that was previously given through the DWP. 
Um, are you able to, to comment on that? And because I know in your report, you also say that the impact of benefits um, and what the government expect out of it isn't really clear, that it's that they're able to report on qualitative measures about the approach, but not so much the, the impact in terms of quantitative methods. Can you talk about why that's important and what you'd expect to see? Of course, I'm happy to start on that, actually, and I'll, I'll certainly bring Kirsty in uh, on, on both the points that you raise. Um, Data gaps isn't a unique feature, unfortunately, of this report. I mean, think for, um, for the committee's interest, you know, Audit Scotland regularly comments on the need for better data. The Public Audit Committee um, and its uh, predecessor committee, the uh, the Papals Committee, also commented the need for for better high quality data to support transparency, scrutiny, and and you know and more effective um, implementation of public spending programmes. So it's a feature here, and um, we recognise the um, the fiscal commission's concerns in it. I think it would be concerning at any stage, but I think given the scale of public spending that we're talking about through the rollout of the devolved benefits programme, referencing the fiscal commission's own analysis of a potentially 1.3 billion pounds gap, all of that requires high quality data, reliable forecasts, and even I guess it doesn't just relate to this programme in and of itself has really significant fiscal consequences um, that we all want to see that are produced with reliable forecasts with an indication of how, how that will evolve. But before I hand over to Kirsty, I think one of the things we haven't seen uh, necessarily or done any uh, detailed work on, I suppose, is the, the relationship uh, in detail between the data gap and then what that means for the um, the rollout of uh, of the devolved benefits uh, so far, we're keeping a close eye um, on it. Um, but it's really it's a it's an important point for the agency and the program to be clear on what the fiscal commission's expectations are in terms of uh, the future rollouts um, of uh, of devolved benefits. Uh, I'm going to pause again, Ms. Duncan Glancy, and I'm, I'm going to bring Kirsty in. She can say a bit more. Thank you. Yeah, I think, as uh, the Auditor General has mentioned, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has reported really clearly on its concerns around the data gaps and what it means for its work. Um, and I think that links very much to something we were saying in the report about thinking about how systems are being developed at this stage where they are in development and there is the opportunity to really build that in from the start, really thinking about how they work with data users such as the Scottish Fiscal Commission to understand what's needed and how they ensure that that is considered appropriately when they're making choices about what aspects of features, uh, digital systems features um, to build in and what the, the implications of that is for the future in terms of being able to access data back from the system. Um, and that's something we've touched on just at the, the kind of latter part of the report about the need to have that information so that that can be um, evaluated and assessed in terms of understanding the kind of longer term value for money and impact of um, of the benefits that are being rolled out. I mean, we comment and we have done previously on the really um, wide ranging work that's been done by Social Security Scotland and its partners um, and those people who use the system. Um, a really like large package of work around building up. That sort of charter measurement framework and that positive approach to doing that, but it's just moving beyond those kind of qualitative um, measures, which are really important, but to also um, balance that with some other measures which allow, um, as the Auditor General mentioned, that robust um, and routine sort of understanding of the impact of the benefits as we move forward. Thank, um, thank you both um, for, for your answers there. Uh, do you think that the data and therefore the forecasts are reliable? So I think it's going to be hard to be definitive on that point, actually, with the with the scale of the program and and the scale of change. Um, certainly, I think just if I can draw the committee's attention, I suppose, to the um, in a in our report. Apologies, Ms. Duncan. It's like five in the report, actually, where we set out, I suppose, the scale of change that have taken place um, since the financial memorandum, with anticipated costs at that point of £308 million through to the programme business case of 2020 of £651 million, and then 
now up to uh, 685 billion pounds. So the uh, the scale of change has reduced between 2020 and 2021. Um, we've no reason to doubt the, the latest forecasts, but I think that given the complexity of this programme, its scale um, really goes back to your original uh, point, therefore, that that uh, needs to be set out clearly, subject to public scrutiny um, with appropriate regularity. Um, but we also just, you know, um, from, forgive me for repeating myself, actually, just that the scale of difference is really important here, with the Fiscal Commission suggesting there's £1.3 billion. So it's not just the programme uh, in itself, it then will influence the choices that um, will lead to public spending across the piece, the opportunity cost that it might make. So it's really important that they are as reliable as possible. The, the Fiscal Commission uh, may be better placed, I suppose, to give a, a detailed answer on that point. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's everything from me just now. Thanks, Convener. That, Pam. Um, we'll move on to questions from Paul McLennan, um, and then I think we'll be back to yourself, um, Pam. <coughs> Paul? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Good morning, Order General. Um, the question really for me is around about the, um, about the, the focus, I think it's quoted, the focus on the systems uh, has been around about what matters most to the client. Um, what's the state of functionality in systems that have not been prioritised? And just really to lead on from that, we met with the Scottish Fiscal Commission I think about a month ago now, and they were talking about data gaps. And it's just really to see what, if, you, if you share these concerns um, around about that, whether the systems have been designed in a way which take account. Um, I suppose the key thing that came to that is, is obviously the need to produce data to inform the budget. How accurate was that? Uh, good morning, Mr. McClellan. Yeah, th uh, thank you for your question. I, I'll, I'll try and cover off as many of those as possible, but as ever, I'll bring Kirsty in uh, to supplement anything that uh, I respond. Um, I think the phrase that we used when we, when we published uh, our report in terms of um, agile and, and data was one of trade-offs. And, um, and, and that is a feature of the agile uh, project management implementation choices. Um, we generally felt that that was an appropriate choice to make with the scale of um, programme in front of us with the implementation of devolved benefits. That, as we set out in the report that the, through the programme, it was deemed appropriate to focus on those components of the system that will make the most impact to service users. And some of that's borne out well. You know, like even we reference in our uh, report that um, customer satisfaction levels are high with people who, who use the system. So I think it's over 80% of those that were surveyed found it easy or very easy to use. 94% you know, say that they were treated with kindness, and that you know, mirrors the, the overall tenets of the approach about you know, dignity, fairness, and respect. So see that coming through and what it means for for customer experience. The other hand, though, is that there is that trade-off. There does then need to be a need in terms of the integrity of the system, the long-term functionality for it to be uh, subject to um, better expression, almost kind of like to go back and do the work needed just to secure it in future. And that will come at a cost. Um, so that that will need to be factored into uh, future budget setting um, and so on. The point you make about data gaps and does that um, impact on the forecast. That's not something we've seen yet, um, but it's important that, again, the agency, um, the government programme team are alert to what that will mean. Um, but it doesn't detract the overall point that the Fiscal Commission are concerned about the quality of data and what that will mean for the reliability um, of forecasts. So, um, you know, positive progress thus far, but a lot of work still to be done to, to uh, conclude the successful rollout ensure that the data is reliable, supports the longer term forecasts, and that integrity point of the system can be secured for the future. Um, I hope I'm going to pause again, actually. I think there's probably a couple of points that I've missed, so I'm just going to check in with Kirsty. Thank you. I was just going to mention that um, with the move of the Chief Digital Officer and his team of staff from the programme and uh, the implementation programme over into Social Security Scotland itself, what we have commented on the report is a strengthening of that um, focus and understanding within Social Security Scotland about the technical aspects of the systems which are being developed and that kind of strengthening of the operational voice within that the decision making processes around what systems need to be developed and what um, aspects are being prioritised or potentially traded off 
So we do see a kind of strengthening of that, and, and that's something that we'll be keen to kind of just keep an eye on as we do our annual audit work to see how that develops and what impact that has. Okay. Chair, just a, a, a supplementary, if that's okay, just on a little bit more detail. Obviously, in, in regards to the data gap, and Kirsty does this yourself, or back to the general, in terms of what we don't want to get to is obviously get to the next audit, and, and it's looked upon saying there's still issues with the data gap. It's really just to see what work is on, well, what work will be ongoing between now and the next audit, if you like, between the data gap. Because when we spoke to the Fiscal Commission, there was obviously an issue that they had, and it, it, it's what's going to go on between now and the next audit, rather than raise it at the next audit, and it's still a concern. Can you highlight or, or outline what that piece of work would be in terms of how you're going to continue to monitor this, particularly around about the data gap, because it does inform, as we said, the, the, the budget going forward, and what is a particularly difficult time to almost track demand uh, and where we are just now. Yeah, I'm happy to start again, I think, and Kirsty can say a bit more about what we understand the steps that the um, agency are, are taking uh, to resolve. Um, from our perspective, you're right, we don't want to repeat audit recommendations uh, from one report to the next. We want to see um, impact at that. The, the, and it's not just ourselves, as you, as you rightly mentioned, that have focused on it, that the Fiscal Commission too are clearly highlighting it. So we'd expect to see um, focus from management on um, engagement with the Fiscal Commission primarily, that they're clear on you know, what um, information they need to support their forecasts. We know also that the agency has good relationships with the DWP, that they are engaging routinely with them, they're sharing services, sharing resources. Um, and particularly note that the Fiscal Commission have made that comparison between Social Security Scotland and the DWP about the quality of data. So I don't want to oversimplify it, um, but given that you know, if there is a, a level of contentment about DWP, that we would expect that that relationship could be used to better understand what the Fiscal Commission's requirements are. Um, but the overall point for me is that yeah, we, we're keen to see impact, but you know, we're not repeating uh, audit recommendations um, a number of years down the line. Um, Kirsty might have more detail. Kirsty. Nothing too much to add um, to that, but just to comment that um, we mentioned in the report we see the early establishment of dedicated um, digital teams to support some of this more routine um, capacity building within the system and understanding of where um, data needs um, might need to flow out of the system and how that is worked into digital um, updates to systems as opposed to the work that's ongoing on the kind of major benefit launches and major benefit um, design. So that's something that I think we would be keen to see how that, that is being maintained and make sure that that capacity is being maintained within Social Security Scotland to support that work. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, convener. Thanks both. Thanks very much. Um, Pam, did you want to come back in on this theme? Um, to be honest, all my questions in this area have now been answered. So. I'm okay. Thank you. I kind, of, I kind of thought that was going to be the case. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to our next theme, which is round about workforce, and we're going to start with Jeremy Balfour. Um, over to yourself, Jeremy. Thank you, uh, Kavina. I, I think we've dealt with some of this under the previous theme, so hopefully we can move on quicker. But one area that I just want to um, do with you, Auditor General, is there's always been a slightly strange relationship between the design of the system, which has been done by Scottish Government, and then the implementation of a scheme, which has been done by the new, or I don't know how long we keep calling it a new agency for, but by the agency. Um, do you know how many people are still working from Scottish Government perspective in regard to the design and the practical running together of the scheme? And if so, do you know at what cost that is? Because obviously the agency doesn't carry that cost, but it is a cost related to Social Security. Um, I'm happy to start. I said, but again, I'll bring Kirsty in uh, in a moment or two. Um, at a high level, you're, you're right in your analysis, um, Mr. Balfour, that um, there was the split between um, the new agency and the programme team in terms of progress. And we would recognise, I think we say in a, a report, that um, that's generally worked well. Relationships um, and roles and responsibilities have. Um, got a point there to support the overall implementation um, of the programme. I think at various points we've noted that the agency might have been more closely involved, but that's not a theme that we're uh, seeing um, uh, in uh, current uh, state of affairs. 
Um, I'm going to turn to Kirsty in a moment, but actually, just about into, you asked about costs and, and what that means um, for the future. So we, we've, at a high level, looked at the um, the, the budget for uh, the indicative spending um, and the spending review that talks about a, a level two spend around uh, 0 0.4 billion, 400 million pounds. And we think about three quarters of that relates to Social Security Scotland. So still a feature of you know, a significant amount of public spending also in the completion of the rollout of the programme. Um, we, we note that the overall estimate in terms of uh, the delivery of the programme is £685 billion. This is the number we reported up to the end of uh, 2025. Um, and clearly much of that will be in terms of staff costs. Some reliance on consultants that we've reported previously um, as well to uh, deliver the technical expertise and the complexity of the system. Um, I'm going to pass over to Kirsty in terms of uh, the split that you'd asked her about uh, and anything further she wishes to, to supplement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, at paragraph 61 of our report, we set out the current sort of staffing levels of um, the implementation programme, or as they were in February 2022. Um, at that point, there was about 650 full-time equivalent staff working within the implementation programme, and at that point, they were intending that that would raise to about 780 uh, staff. Um, we anticipate from what the information that was put out in the last programme business case that this period in time, kind of 2022, 2023, will be um, the expected sort of peak of the programme. And then we would expect a tail off as more of the activity is delivered and more of the kind of focus shifts to the ongoing operation of the benefits under Social Security Scotland. Um, we also set out at Exhibit 5 the breakdown of the costings from implementation, um, which at the moment, or at that point in time, the programme was estimating that about um, 349 million would be the expected staffing costs as a um, as a share of that whole 600. And, um, sorry, I've lost my number. <laughs> as the whole um, implementation, um, that again is something we would expect to be updated in the um, revised programme business case and updated estimates which the Scottish Government has indicated it plans to publish by the end of this year. So that should give an updated position on where they see that staffing level going um, and the overall costing they expect the staffing to, um, to contribute to the overall implementation cost. Thank you. That's uh, really helpful. Just one quick follow-up question, um, if that's okay, Kavina. Just around that, in regard to kind of good practice and going forward, it, 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 is it acceptable to have almost two separate teams working on this? Or from an auditor's perspective, would it be better practice for those who are working within Scottish Government to be actually, I don't know whether I can attend it, to Peter Cross, plot across, so that we have one, you know, one team working under this? I mean, I appreciate it has worked okay to this extent, but as the service continues, is it better practice to have simply one team who deal with Social Scotland, a bit like DWP, rather than having two separate almost identities? Yeah. Um, so I think we understand the rationale for why there were two separate teams. The, the complexity of you know, both, I suppose, the system development, the policy uh, development on one side, and then the policy implementation through the agency on the other. Inevitably, as the programme reaches maturity, the level of employees in the programme development side will ebb and the, it will become about the delivery and the implementation and I'm an agency and a much smaller team. Um, I, I don't think I've got a particularly strong view about whether um, it would be that was the right model or whether it should have just been entirely through the agency. Um, what we would say and what we see of agencies elsewhere is that agencies are much closer to um, the centre of government than NDPBs or, or non-ministerial offices, so there will always be a close relationship. From our perspective, we'd say that the, it, um, it's about the quality of the relationship that, that matters most, that there's a clarity around roles and responsibilities and, and relationships with it. Um, and I think that's something that, that we've seen with a couple of you know, tweaks here and there over the course of the programme. Um, but we'd also say, actually, and I'm keen just to, to make that point, is that 
we've been we've had really excellent engagement uh, from both the agency and uh, the government team uh, in terms of our work on benefits over many years. That they uh, we've had strong engagement, real clarity of message and understanding actually, and that has really helped our audit approach at the same time. I hope that's helpful. That's helpful. Uh, thank you. And I've got no more questions on workforce, Camina. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, we'll move on to questions from Emma Roddick, and then we'll hand it back over to Pam Duncan Glancy after that. Emma? Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, a lot of employers are, are really struggling at the moment to recruit staff, uh, particularly for uh, fixed term or, or temporary contracts. Is it a good sign that, that Social Security Scotland is managing to recruit staff at pace despite this? Um, yes, it is. It is a good sign, actually. I think there are um, challenges um, in the, the, um, the employment market. Um, as you rightly point out, that you know, for some people, they'll, they'll want a temporary job or a fixed term, it will suit their circumstances. Um, but for more people, it's that security of uh, employment. So um, that the agency have been able to recruit um, is positive, and I think, and particularly borne out by the scale of change um, of numbers working for the agency. So, yes, so I think that's a fair assessment. Great, and I think going back to to what you were just saying about um, engagement being really good, um, I think you know part of the reason we're managing to, to sit here and scrutinise changing in in staffing forecasts is because we've been given the figures. Um, so, do you feel there's also an overall commitment to transparency by the agency? Um, so I think so. Just to echo the point about engagement, you know, that we've had really strong engagement from uh, from both the agency um, and the, the government team. Um, we, we welcome the publication um, that's uh, planned later um, in the year about the the kind of future uh, spending plans, um, and um, but we think there's a little bit more to do. I think particularly looking about the uh, the scale of change of spending. That's set out um, in the report um, that it hasn't been a routine feature over the course of the programme to note uh, the, the change in spending profile. And I think, as Kirsty mentioned uh, a few minutes ago uh, as well, is that keen to see closer connection as the programme moves forward to the government's national performance framework as well, looking at a broader range of measures um, that have up until now largely been qualitative. Um, an assessment to bring in more quantitative values as well. Um, and um, I, th I note that the, this morning, I've not had a chance to read it yet, that the uh, Finance and Public Administration Committee have published their latest report on the National Performance Framework as well. So, uh, important for the programme and for the agency to take stock of that, that they're appropriately connected so that those outcomes ultimately, you know, public spending is to deliver outcomes, that you know, people's experience. And uh, what the significant amounts of public spending are delivering for for users of the um, of the bulk benefits. Thank you for that. That's really clear. And just just one final um, question around this. I think it is worth noting that a, a significant portion of the changes to to staffing and costs um, over time are due to things like reprioritisation within the DWP, um, data sharing issues that that took longer than expected for. Uh, that government to resolve. So, in terms of responsible spending and governance, is it is it justified that the Scottish government and Social Security Scotland prioritised a uh, safe case transfer for users? Really important safe case transfer, I think, and you know, and perhaps some of that is borne out by the experience that people have had uh, in dealing with Social Security Scotland. I mentioned to um, Mr. McClellan a few minutes ago about the, some of the satisfaction. Levels that, that people have had. Yes, there's always a, a connection to the, uh, what it costs to deliver it, and the scale of change is, is, as well too about the, the rollout of the adult disability payments uh, as well uh, in, in August and more to come have all had a bearing on some of the costs. And I think I mean, just as I suppose a, as a final point, um, that's why we haven't made a, a, a critical judgment about the. The scale of change in costs in the rollout of the programme that some might have expected us to do, and we've, and we've done in other cases where public spending has gone significantly uh, higher than original budget, really just because of the amount of variables that were in place when the financial memorandum um, was first published. Um, the scale of change, 
the relationship with DWP, the uptake from users, all of these are really significant components that have led to um, the numbers that we have. But it really perhaps reinforces the point about the need, therefore, for regular reporting to support transparency and scrutiny going forward. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, Pam, did you have further questions on this? I know members and, um, and the Auditor General have helpfully asked quite a few of the questions that were coming down the line. So just to double check, Pam, whether you want to back in. Um, I do. I've got one specific question, but forgive me if it has already been asked. Um, some of my, my signal's not been 100%, um, but uh, so if it has been asked, feel free just to say you've already answered it. Um, the, I, I was wondering, do, do you have any concerns about the impact on the workforce planning um, in Social Security Scotland and also the programme um, from the, the DFM's announcements on uh, cuts in that area? Services to manage um, their their budget with the resources um, that they have. Um, I think it's clear to see that th there will be some real fiscal challenges for for the next Scottish budget um, and uh, and the years beyond. That's clearly set out in the resource spending review and the medium term financial strategy. Add to the to the point that we've um, discussed this morning about the fiscal commission's concerns, not just about data quality, but but looking at the divergence that the Scottish specific choices. Are compared to the block grant, so uh, you know, their forecast was published after um, we uh, completed our report of 1.3 billion pounds. Inevitably, that leads to you know, difficult choices that won't just be limited to Social Security Scotland; it will affect all of the, the Scottish budget. You know, so, but for any budget, any government to to manage within the financial resources at its disposal, clearly our role is not to uh, comment on, on policy choices. But rather to note that the, the, those choices will have to be made to remain within the, the confines of the, uh, the fiscal environment that Scotland operates in. Thank you. The, the other questions I have have already been answered. Thanks, Thanks very much for that, Pam. And Auditor General, maybe just to pick up on um, something you said there before I move to Paul McLennan, who's got another question. Uh, and it takes us back to the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, and their, you know, their, their um, Discussion around about the data gaps, which we've already touched on this morning, and understanding how a, you know a policy implementation actually realises um, the outcome that that was intended. I think our committee's concern um, is round about you know those missing you know pieces of data at the moment. How will we actually know whether policy is achieved its objective? Um, looking back, if we don't have robust um, data, as we're being told at the moment. So sorry to bring us back to that subject, but I think it's something that we're quite focused on. I'm glad you mentioned it again, convener. It's, it's hugely important, and um, it has been a feature of some of our other audit reporting about the need for um, robust data to support implementation um, of policies, but also that evaluation piece, not just many years in advance, but actually over the course of implementation. Because we're looking at the complexity of this uh, program, is that it's no surprise that it will take. Know, different turns during the course of the of the program. Policymakers' implementation of those policies by officials really need high quality data to, to make that assessment. Um, there's an opportunity now to get that right. You know, with the the fiscal commission's recommendations, the relationships with the DWP, um, the views of service users as well as a as a key factor um, in that. So it's, <clears throat> it's very welcome. That service users are reporting that they're getting a, a positive experience. Um, one of the findings from our report is that, um, as I mentioned um, a moment or two ago, is that to bring in some more high quality uh, quantitative data, but also a, a wider um, evaluation strategy as part of the, how well the agency, how well government make that assessment of the success of this uh, program of, of public spending. Um, so we're keen to see uh, progress on that. Um, inevitably, there are risks if it doesn't happen. You know, think, um, for our, for our own work as well. Ultimately, we'll want to form a value for money judgment um, in in due course. We're not in a position where we can quite do that. And of course, for your own committee, we will want to be satisfied about you know, how well the program is being implemented and to to make some of those assessments using high quality data. So um, some work to do, convener, I would say. 
Thanks very much for that, Auditor General. Um, Paul McLennan, over to yourself for a question. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I, I, two questions: one, one general, one kind of specific. The specific one is really just on about, in light of what remains to be done in the program. Do you have any comment on the administration and the budget, Social Security administration and the budget set out in the spending review? And in the more general, uh, general one, um, Auditor General, is really in about what are the key risks in developing the remaining aspects of the program? Yeah, thanks, Mr. McLean. I think um, I'll I'll check with Kirsty actually about the um, the indicative budget. I think I mentioned a, um, a figure of 400 million, but um, I'll just I'll check if I've got that right, I'll, and then I'll come back in on the key risks in a second. Kirsty. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, that is the figure that um, we were looking at the 400 and I think 401 million set out in the spending review. And, and is there any comment on that? I mean, do you have any issues around about that? Whether that's enough or is there any comment at this stage on on that 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 indicative budget for that at this stage? I, th I think ultimately that will be for you know for the agency and the government yeah. to to decide if that's appropriate um, or yeah. not. Um, I mentioned to the uh, convener a, a second or two ago. Um, it's a complex program. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, look at this yeah. the scale of uh, benefits still to be administered. And I'll maybe come back to that uh, in a second to your second question. Um, and the number of people that are employed, Kirsty mentioned uh, a second or two ago about that that's going to peak as well. So all manner of you know significant there are workforce challenges to be overcome. And then if I can move on, I think there's also looking at the scale of what's yet to be delivered is still significant. So for me that would be the, the biggest risk. You look at we, when we try and set that out on uh, exhibit one to the paper, um, there are there are still a number of large complex benefits to be um, implemented. Um, and the agency's track record so far is strong. You know, it's done well in implementing benefits um, in Scotland. Um, but there's work to do, and inevitably there will be some you know, uh, high-quality data that's going to be required to uh, assess the implementation. Um, and there's obviously the other risk that I think is appropriate to mention is some of the scale of the fiscal risks that are relevant to the to the rollout of the programme. Um, there are expectations among service users of what will be delivered and when, so the agency will clearly have to manage those. Um, but as the Fiscal Commission have clearly set out, that doing all of the delivery of this programme within the confines of the um, of Scotland's budget, as it diverges further from the, the block grant that's um, uh, supporting these benefits, that will lead to policy choices um, from the government. All of those will have to be managed in the round. General, thank you for that. Thanks, convener. Thanks very much. Um, we'll go back to Jeremy Balfour, who will have um, some questions around about remaining work and key risk. And then Paul McLennan, back to you. And then if any other members have any questions, if they please type in the, the chat bar, that would be helpful because we've kind of covered questions as we've went along. So um, just to round us off at the end. So Jeremy, over to yourself. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, and yeah, as you said, I think a lot of it was covered uh, in the previous questions. I suppose you've talked about the risk going forward in regard to, to staffing um, and um, in regard to implementation of the larger benefits. Um, I suppose just a very general question is any other things we should be looking at, any other things we should be monitoring as a committee over the next couple of years, or the general? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Balfour. I, I think I would just repeat the point about the fiscal risk that um, exists. So, um, staffing program rollout. And the fiscal position feel like the most significant components of this program um, that they have been well managed thus far, um, but this inevitably require even further attention. Um, the, the point about the, we've touched on it in passing as well, and, and forgive me to Kirsty actually because she, she might have mentioned these um, as well, is that some of the system implementation brings risks as well. So agile, you know, I think it's the right approach, um, but it does have those trade offs. So there will be a need for the agency just to to satisfy itself, satisfy users, Parliament, that they are dealing with all of those aspects of system development that have moved at a different pace from the rollout of the programme. So that's going to be an important part as well. Um, and then it, it's as real, it's a risk as well as an opportunity for the government and the agency to set out uh, their evaluation of the impact of the implementation of the programme. That this significant sums of public spending are 
delivering what they intended. So looking to see some of those data gaps and that strategy uh, set out um, as soon as possible. Um, I'm going to pause again, actually. I'm sure there's a few points that Kirsty will want to mention too. Thank you. Not um, Nothing uh, substantial to add to that, but just to highlight, um, as the Auditor General was talking about, just the, um, the ongoing delivery of the digital systems, I think will be something we are very keen to keep um, an eye on as they progress, um, with a mindset that we are now into large-scale day-to-day delivery or administration of benefits over the next few years, alongside ongoing implementation of new benefits which is really a change in scale for Social Security Scotland now that it is into delivery and case transfer of adult disability payment and just that ability to focus and have the attention on both sort of aspects of their business in terms of the digital systems delivery. And there are, and we've highlighted in the report, a few areas where there will need to be decisions made about long-term digital solutions. Um, I think we highlighted specifically the payments platform, um, and just things like this, which will need to be delivered and given um, the time and space alongside the ongoing administration of the large scale benefits. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Just one very final question. It's just going back to actually the issue around um, staffing. And um, I think my colleague Emma Wardock pointed out that we've got a very positive pickup. Have you any information of where these individuals are coming from? Are they Local people in Dundee, there used to be the story that everyone was moving from DWP to uh, Social Security Scotland, and whether that's true or not, I expect we'll never know. But do you do any looking at where people have come from in regard to previous jobs or geographically where they are coming from? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I've got that information to hand. Um, I can check with Kirsty in a minute whether she's got any more detail. Um, on that, certainly something that you know that the agency themselves we, we know will be closely monitoring through their through their workforce planning, um, and we'll we'll take a view um, on that through the annual audit. But I'm not sure if we if we've got that detail. If we don't, um, we can come back to the committee in writing um, if we if we have it. But I'll check with Kirsty first. Thanks. So we don't have any detail about where um, employees are coming from. So previous employment, for example, um, alongside the kind of um, the workforce um, statistics that the Scottish Government publishes on Social Security Scotland, they do publish a breakdown of location of staff, so once they're into Social Security Scotland, where they're based, and that shows the kind of split between staffing in uh, Glasgow offices and in the Dundee head offices as well. So as um, the most up-to-date data that was published in September, reflecting a position up to June 2022, showed that around 55% of Social Security Scotland staff are Glasgow-based, and around 33% are based in Dundee across the various offices, with the remainder being in various other local um, or regional areas. Um, so that is information that's published, but not more on the side of where they have come into Social Security Scotland from. Okay, uh, and that's very helpful. Thank you for that question. I suppose that just leads on to one other quick question. Um, we as a committee, on a number of occasions, have had the uh, pleasure of visiting the offices in Dundee. Um, they're a fairly large building. Um, as we come out of COVID and as people come back, do you look at whether that office is good value and is it being used and how many people are actually working in that office in regard to a cost to Social Security Scotland? I may be happy to start on that one. Actually, Kirsty can come in in a second. Um, so we, the agency will, will need to do that. You know, so really, um, as will all public bodies need to take a view about the their estate in the round, you know, whether it's, it's occupancy levels, their costs, um, the, you know, the, the respective roles and responsibilities they have, and, um, and public access to the building. Um, we know, of course, through the medium-term financial strategy, the resource spending review that the government uh, set out earlier in the spring, that the use of the public sector estate is expected to be a key feature of spending plans associated efficiencies um, over the years ahead. Um, it's obviously the case that for this programme that the presence in Dundee and, and Glasgow, as Kirsty uh, rightly mentions, were a key part of um, bringing opportunities, uh, job 
um, secure jobs, well-paid jobs to these cities. Um, but I think it's probably too early to tell yet what that will mean in terms of delivery of services uh, for the public uh, and what hybrid working might yet look like. Um, our view is clear, though, that um, if the estate is to be uh, changed and used differently, then that has to be done through you know, longer-term planning, public consultation, um, and set out in, uh, in financial plans. So, uh, something we'll, we'll keep a close eye on. Thank you, and thank you, Convener. No more questions today. Thanks very much for that. Um, thank you, Auditor General, um, and thank you both for um, coming along this morning on a, a Monday morning quite early um, and um, helping us to facilitate this rescheduled meeting. That's very helpful. If you think there's anything that you need to follow up in writing, please do so. Um, and you're able to leave the meeting by hanging up that wee red telephone button up in the corner when you're you're ready to do so. Um, thank you both um, for coming along. Um, the committee is now going to consider um, our next item of business, which is agenda item four, um, which is a negative instrument, council tax reduction and council tax discounts, miscellaneous amendment number two, Scotland regulations 2022. And the background information is outlined in paper number three. Um, this instrument is laid under the negative procedure, which means that its provisions will come into force unless the parliament agrees to a motion to annul them. No motions to annul have been laid. Do members have any comment on the instrument at all? No. Nope. Um, if, as we don't have any comments on it, um, I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any further recommendations in relation to. Are we all agreed on that? Yeah, I can only see Jeremy. Right, I'm seeing. Okay, now I've seen everybody's nodding heads. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'll now close the public part of this meeting and invite the committee members to move into private session. Um, members are invited to join the private meeting via the link um, provided. I'll see you all over there shortly. Thank you very much.